you basically just need a lot of people who are driven and um, I look for the personality of people who will support each other. Expect things to fail when we try something new, so it's okay if it fails. Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of a new show called Manufactured Excellence. I'm your host, Rye Russell, and we are going to be exploring the world of manufacturing. Everything from team building to production and everything in between. I'm really excited because for our first episode, I have somebody that has been manufacturing excellence since the day that I was born. My father, Tom Russell. Dad, my dad has worked in all sorts of different types of manufacturing environments. And he's here today to tell us about what makes for a good manufacturing environment. So, Dad, thanks for manufacturing excellence with me and my sister. And I'm excited to talk to you today. I'm excited to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. So, Dad, I want to ask first, like, what are some of the manufacturing experiences you have had over the years? Uh, let me think. I started out uh, working in textiles, uh, making. Uh, cloth uh, electric blankets. Yep. Uh, I've done that, made uh, needle punch felt for uh, a multitude of um, uses, uh, including tunnel felt and uh, pool table felt. Um, like the Brunswick pool tables? Uh, I think they may have been one of our. Oh, ones. very cool. <laughs> um, also, I've worked in uh, making missile noses. Uh, what was that like? was a carbon fiber uh, textile. Uh, that was very interesting. I happened to be working there when we had, uh, when 911 happened. Wow. Um, so uh, that kind of put us into full gear making uh, missile noses for that. Wow. That time of our uh, history. Uh, so that was also, that was very interesting. Uh, I also did a stint for six years at Netflix, uh, doing distribution for their DVDs uh, for Northern New England. And uh, most recently, I'm, uh, oh, I also worked at a, at a medical facility that is now mm -hmm. a leader making the COVID tests. Uh, cool. We made flu tests at that time with works on the same platform. Um, and now I'm working at a company called Intuity Medical and we make a glucometer. Uh, Very cool. So you've had a wide range of manufacturing experiences. And I'm curious, what are some of the commonalities? Because, I mean, you're making blankets and missile noses and large equipment to kind of automate distribution for Netflix. What is the one thing that you would say all manufacturing has in common? Teams. Teams. Yeah. So my, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm very passionate about building teams. Uh, you know, my, my part of these manufacturing facilities has been a, you know, a small part uh, as far as, uh, Taking care of the manufacturing floor. I don't take care of uh, marketing. I don't take care of the big picture. I take care of my 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 niche, and my niche is building the team to manufacture and get things done on time and uh, at cost. So when I think of manufacturing, I just think of a big equipment, and I think probably a lot of people tuning in do as well. And you insert something into the machine and insert different components, and at the end of the line comes out a device. But I know it's not that easy. You have to have a lot of individuals in their hands on this. And I'm curious, you know, we don't talk a lot about team leadership in mm -hmm. production. We talk about efficiency and automation. So I'd love for you to kind of break down what you think makes a successful team. So I think for me, the, the what makes a successful team is that you get the right personalities in the right places. Um, you know, all companies need uh, the dreamers, the, you know, the optimists, uh, they need realists. Uh, I, I suspect I'm more of a realist and they need, uh, you know, they actually need a couple pessimists to poke holes in, in, in our dreams. Um, so most good, good companies have a little mixture of all three, uh, with the, with the bulk of people hopefully being realists. And uh, one thing I've noticed about you is you're really good at managing all three types of personality traits, the pessimist, the optimist, and the realist. What are some of the challenges in doing that? Well, I think for me, building a team, I'm, and right now I'm building on a pretty large team uh, to go 24-7 in this facility. 
Um, for me, what I try to do is, is recognize right from the get go that, you know, each position has, um, has a pay scale. You know, people are paid to, to do the job they're going to do. And once that's established, then everybody is an equal. Mm. Um, so I try to make sure that, you know, we, you know, we treat, you know, if a supervisor is frustrated by a brand new operator not living up to that expectation, I try to remember if that person was as good as the supervisor, they would <laughs> also be a supervisor and I don't need a room full of supervisors. Sure. So, um, you know, I think that we, you know, we, we want to hold, hold people accountable to the job that we've hired them to do. Uh, but not try to hold them accountable to more unless that, unless we've all agreed that they're going to, um, you know, contribute more and learn and get an opportunity to grow. And with teams, I mean, obviously you have the individuals, whether if you're going to a new manufacturing site or you're starting a new manufacturing site, you know, th there may be teams there. There may be individuals there, but you mentioned hiring. And I can only imagine that hiring is one of the most critical aspects of team building. So I'm curious, what do you look for in candidates and how do you find like the right interview style? How do you interview people to fit? Yeah, so I don't interview like most. I don't have a script that I interview by. I don't have uh, set questions that I interview by. I'm, I, I'm a very I, I gut um, interviewer. Um, but I try to make sure that the person is very aware of the type of team I'm trying to build and that if they don't think they're going to be a good fit, that we don't waste each other's time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also, and so I just set, uh, I, I let every, every single person I have interviewed probably in the last 15 years, I have, I've given them the same example. I, you know, that I'm building a team that if, you know, regardless of your skill set, we're going to try to make your skill set you know, we're looking for a certain skill set that I'm hiring to, and you're going to hope, you know, hopefully you meet that skill set. Um, but what I'm looking for to build the team is people who want to show up every day, ready to work, uh, you know, take the job seriously. Um, I'm all for social, being social because I want the team to get along. We're, you know, we're a family. We, uh, we don't, I don't recognize a lot of individual contribution. What I do is, uh, recognize the success of a team and then those individuals who are better at things than others rather than rewarding them all the time for being better i'd rather reward the team for sharing that knowledge mm -hmm. um so that's something i learned a long time ago is if you you know if you have a lot of uh individual rewards people keep knowledge to themselves if you reward the team um, then they're more apt to share that knowledge so the whole team succeeds rather than individually succeeding so that's that's uh, that's something I take very seriously. Uh, it's been very successful. It's interesting because when, obviously, I focus a lot more on the sales and marketing side of business. And it's interesting because I think so often we celebrate the sales leaders, the kind of the hot shots, when there's always a team in sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I think that side of any business can really take some notes from as well, because a lot of times when you have that hot shot, they might not be the right culture fit in some way. It's like they may kind of hoard that knowledge, if you will. And so it's, it's and that's why I love doing shows like this, because every department, I think, often are siloed. Mm -hmm. And I think it helps sometimes having some understanding. So the sales and marketing, understanding what's going on in production in production, understanding what's going on in sales and marketing and kind of bringing that together. And so I'm curious, like when you're interviewing for, let's say it's some a machine operator and you've got a, a team full of optimists, are you going to be looking for a pessimist to kind of round out that team or how does that work? Yeah, I don't think it's quite that simple. Sure. <laughs> um, I think mostly, I, I think that you're going to have a mixture of those people, um, regardless. Um, I think that, uh, you want people who are driven. Uh, you know, I think the bigger company needs the, the pessimists and optimists. You know, I find some engineers a little more pessimistic than, than salesmen. <laughs> or, uh, or the C, you know, the CEO is, is definitely an optimist, right? And they have the vision and they, and they don't see the obstacles. They expect those below them to, to, to 
navigate those obstacles and be the realists of those obstacles. So I think, I think it's in the bigger picture of the company that you have more of that diversity. Um, as far as being on the production floor, you basically, you basically just need a lot of people who are driven. And, um, I look for the personality of people who will support each other. Mm. Um, and so, you know, and, and so I've, I've had to, uh, coach people who were maybe my best operators, but not necessarily the best socially. Sure. Um, you know, and, and, and let them understand that being the best operator does not make them my best employee. Mm. I might have a, you know, a, a less output operator, but who makes the team better. Um, and that's the, those are the people who I want to develop and support and, and encourage to move forward. One thing that I've learned, and I'm so fortunate because at the uh, Alir Nell Abbott facility that you mentioned, I got the opportunity to work there uh, in high school and a little bit in college. And it was it was fascinating to me because uh, the teams and people in all departments, they have a lot of respect for you. Uh, and at Netflix, same thing. You know, just everybody loves you. And every time that somebody would say something about you to me, it was this firm and fair was kind of what I got. And so, you know, we talked about hiring. I'm curious, like this is something that that I've had troubles with, and I'm sure a lot of you have that are that are tuned in with us, is there's a natural need for some level of discipline in in good team building. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I've always I've really admired you for is how you give some constructive coaching. I've seen you give constructive coaching in somebody walk out of your office almost more empowered than they've ever felt before. Like, you know, and so I'm curious, how do you have tough discipline coaching conversations? Well, I think the word empowered is probably the secret to that. So I don't know if I would have used the word empowered, but I believe that everybody should be encouraged uh, to try to do more. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, 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 most places I go, I try to put some encouraging posters up. And I sure. think uh, the first one I put up at, the, at my current facility was um, every expert was once a beginner. Ooh. And and I believe that. So, you know, I think that anybody can, if they if they want to learn more, they can do that. Um, some people aren't interested in doing that and they fit a niche that we need, uh, you know, and some people do want to do more. But everybody wants to be recognized for the effort they put in. And sure. So the first thing I always do is is make sure that I'm I'm thanking people every day for the work they do, um, regardless of what level of work that is. And and when I do need to coach them, I certainly you know if they if they are working for us, they are probably some level of a good employee. So I try to always start off with the things that I appreciate uh, and the things that they're doing well, and then and then talk to them about the things that we need to improve on in order. For us all to move forward and, and succeed as a team. Um, it's not fair to other team members if they're picking up someone else's slack. And those other team members will appreciate it if I coach that person that's not pulling their weight. And then generally speaking, most people want to do well. They're not sure. You know, uh, you know, it's very few individuals that are always trying to get away with something, I guess is, sure. is what you say. And, and if you coach them, well enough, then you can change some of that behavior. Some people, you're not going to change that behavior. And then there's maybe a different place for them to be working. And I've had, I've terminated people after, after coaching and had, I've actually had one gentleman come back to me several years later and thank me for letting them go because then they went and found the job that they were meant to do. Cool. And they were much happier. Right. So and I wouldn't say that happened with everybody I've coached. <laughs> Um, but it was very rewarding to hear that from that individual because when they left my office, uh, it wasn't under those same circumstances, right? Um, but I think that generally speaking, you know, uh, and like I was saying earlier, when I do interview people, whether I, whether I end up hiring them or not, I always tell them, you know, if you can show up to work every day, ready to work, uh, and, uh, ready to learn and be on time. That's one and that's one bookend is what I call it. The other bookend is that you're respectful of the people around you and respectful of yourself. And I say that if you have any drive that we can fill what's in between, 
mm. um, with coaching and, and education and learning. And that's been, that's been very successful. And this is something that I think a lot of us, we struggle with having those tough conversations. Do you have any tips or best practices? Let's say you've done the coach. You've had an employee that uh, either is not performing, is toxic to the rest of the team, whatever the situation may be. Do you have any suggestions for those in leadership positions on how to have that tough talk of dismissal? Well, I've always, yeah. Um, I, it's tough. <laughs> I'm not a I'm not a person who thinks they need to raise their voice for any reason. Mm. Um, I that doesn't doesn't say that's not to say I haven't. Sure. Um, but it's something I'm not proud of if I have, um, because the way the, the way the world works, that I have a certain amount of authority with my team, right? So I shouldn't have to yell at them in order for them to realize that I have authority. And so that, and then and then the fact that I treat them with respect every day. Thank them for say good morning. Thank them for what they're doing. Remind them that while we're at work, we talk about work. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't talk about what we did on the weekend. That is for break time and lunch time. I'm happy for them to do that. But on the floor, um, we should be talking about how do we improve every day. And it, awesome. and, and and that's the walk we walk. Um, and if you can get the smaller team, that especially those that seem to also command some respect for the rest of the group, to start doing that same thing. Then when you do need to discipline somebody, you've already been treating them respectfully. So you bring them into, the, you know, you bring them into the office. You're being respectful of their privacy. You're not, you know, talking out in front of other people. You know, hey, I'm taking you in because we need to have this conversation. I don't want to do it on the floor because that's not the appropriate place. Mm-hmm. You know, show them a certain amount of respect that they deserve. It's right. not, you know, it, regardless of what that coaching is for they still deserve that respect totally. and i and typically um typically they respond to that that makes a lot of sense one last question deb there's so much lean six sigma all of these different kaizen all these different things Are, does team building play into those things as well is there much education about team building in those uh, i believe there's some uh but it's funny because uh, lean manufacturing uh, is what what I'm mostly familiar with is more than Six Sigma. Um, it just it's it puts order to things. Sure. And if you have a if you don't have a good team, I think the team has to come first. Um, once you have a team that understands continuous improvement is a is a positive thing. It's not hey we just want to we just got you used to this and now we want to change it just to mess with your mind. It's more of hey we want to try things and we expect to fail. Like sure. we expect things to wow. fail when we try something new. So it's okay if it fails. Um, a lot of times we'll hear, oh, we tried that three years ago and it didn't work, right? And we'll say, well, if we tried it three years ago, it must've been a good idea. So what what caused it not to work? And maybe we can address those things and see if we can make it work this time. Or they can point out why it didn't work and we go, Oh yeah, that makes sense. Let's not do that. Right. right. Um, so you, you know, the, 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 the floor knows how their machines work. They know how they function and you need to bring, you need to build that, um, trust so that they can bring to you the information you need in order to improve and have continuous improvement. And, you know, I've, I've said, Hey, you know, we've set up at meetings. This is what we're going to try on Monday. And by noon on Monday, we go, yep, that's not going to work. <laughs> Let's start over. You know, and then and it, once you understand that, you'll have a few people who try to, you know, make things not work, maybe. Sure. Um, and but you can win that over as well, if, you know, with time and, and the right approach. So there's a mad science to all of this as well. There's a lot of experimenting in the manufacturing process. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with process, process, improvement, uh, line leveling, you know, all those terms. Uh, I'm not a big, you know, you got to use every lean term, sure. Um, but you can put those lean pro- programs into place without necessarily making it sound all engineering. Sure. You know? um, but I, you know, I am a big fan of uh, point of use. You know, uh, my my biggest job, I think, is you know, 
short of building the team is to provide the team with the tools they actually need to do their job mm-hmm. um, and listening to them uh, to know what that those tools are. That and seems get them, like a really get them big, to where they need to be. That seems like a really critical point because I feel like a lot of times in manufacturing, we need to get this done. Let's go get this done. And then I feel like a team could feel very deflated if they did not have the tools to accomplish what's being asked of them. Yeah, and and it's uh, what's interesting about human nature is most teams will find ways to get things done without the right tools, mm. and use a lot of times that's not the right way to get it done. Um, so you need to be able to encourage them to, and they'll be doing that. They could be doing that for weeks before you realize sure. that they're they're doing this shortcut, or you know. Um, and so you really need to encourage them to feel confident to tell you what they need and get, and they won't feel confident if you don't get them what they need after they've asked for it. Right. Sure. Um, and, and, or explain to them why it's not possible. Hey, you know, that's not in our budget or that's, you know, that causes another, you know, that would cause damage to the machine or something like that. Then as long as you explain that, that's fine. Um, but get them the tools they need so that they'll continue to ask for what they need and they'll continue to share. Uh, issues with the machine before it becomes a breakdown, uh, you know, all those kind of things. And one last question for you is the term manufactured excellence. What does that term mean to you? Well, that's, <laughs> that's a wonderful question because you had mentioned that term um, maybe a month or so ago. And I think I said to you, what does that mean? And, yeah. and you haven't answered it yet. No. Nope. Um, so manufactured excellence, I suppose to me, it, you know, in my realm, it means ways to develop my team to be the best team they can be, you know, and, and outperform and be willing to work Saturday, even though they had family plans, um, you know, to feel like, the company, the company's success is their success and their success is the company's success. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And I really hope all of you tune in and stay tuned and follow us over here at Manufactured Excellence because I have no idea what the term means, but I think we can learn together throughout the interviews that we have with the amazing pioneers of manufacturing and We've got some incredible guests coming up for you as well in a number of different industries. But first, Dad, thank you so much for agreeing to kick off this show with me. Yeah. I'm super glad to be here. Well, I really appreciate it. And I know everybody else appreciates it. Good. Good. So stay tuned. Go to manufacturedexcellence.com. Be sure to hit that subscribe button because we have a lot of value coming to you this year. We're really excited. Our next episode, we have Rob Works from Python Extraction. We're going to learn about extraction equipment. We have Tyler Hurd, who's going to come and talk to us about prototyping and many, many more. So we will look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Manufactured Excellence. <music>